Good evening and welcome to RFD TV Live. I'm News Director Mark Oppold. Thanks for joining us. Tonight we welcome our friends from Agriculture Liquid Fertilizer. And they, like many companies, want to deliver high quality products to growers. But tonight, to give you an idea of really what sets them apart, why they're such a great partner at RFD TV and why we enjoy having them here, is that they want to talk about this next hour, the changing of the face of agricultural stewardship. What we as a agricultural community can do in a broad brush topic talking about taking care of our precious water supply, stewardship as it relates to a biotech industry and crop protection. And uh, we hope you'll enjoy us. And in fact, uh, we'll be encouraging you. We'll be opening our telephone lines a lot earlier than normal tonight because we know you have uh, comments, suggestions of maybe what you're doing on your farm or ranch across the country to join in our conversation. Joining me in studio tonight, Lonnie Smith, who is senior your marketing manager with Agriculture Liquid Fertilizer. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Mark. Good to have you here and uh, tell our viewers a little bit about your background. You and I share the same home state. Well, yeah, from <laughs> Iowa. I've been working with uh, growers in Iowa for a number of years and about 15 years ago started with Agricultural Liquid Fertilizers in the corporate sense. Been working as a senior marketing manager for about four years now. Very good. And I'm sure, like a lot of folks viewing tonight in our panel here, we we're ready for that growing season now, yeah, aren't we? Winter's yeah, over. Yeah. Let's get to it. Let's get it. Good to have you here. Thanks a lot. And a great topic that we have to talk about stewardship. And thank you for giving the hour uh, to talk about such the important issues that we're going to cover here, Lonnie. Yeah. Good to have you here. Next to Lonnie, a great friend of RFD TV. Many of you have seen him and know him. And we welcome him as well, Brian Hefty. He's a farmer. He said, How do I introduce you? Tell him I'm a Farmer and I'm an agronomist, as well as, of course, co host of Ag PhD, seen Tuesday evenings at 8, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern on RFD TV. Brian, good to see you today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, I, this is something that I am really passionate about. We've been talking all winter long at workshops that Darren and I have been doing and uh, on Ag PhD about ag stewardship because I think that as farmers, we're quite often misrepresented. And so hopefully we can talk about some of those issues tonight. Very good. You, uh, the, the, uh, the operation is in Baltic, South Dakota? Yep, just uh, right north of Sioux Falls, so southeast South Dakota. So and we farm there. You were telling me before going, I didn't realize, I should, I suppose, but uh, you are celebrating the anniversary uh, with Patrick Gotch, uh, one of the first people that you and uh, Patrick got together 15 years ago this day. Uh, yeah, so we've done a brand new half hour show every week for 15 years now. So I often tell farmers, you know, if you're in a family business on your farm, uh, I, I kind of understand what you're going through because I've had to work with my brother every week for 15 years. <laughs> but no, it's been a lot of fun. Good. And thank you, friend. I'm looking forward to your input as well on these on these issues, talking about stewardship. And the third member of our panel is Paul Wegner. Uh, Wenger, he is president of the California Farm Bureau Federation. It's good to meet you today, Paul. Thanks, Mark. Pleasure being here. Uh, yeah, I'm a third generation farmer. We, uh, my grandparents came from Pennsylvania in 1910, and we started out in the grade B dairy business. Then got into the beef business until people weren't buying home locker beef anymore. And today we raise almonds and walnuts, and you will hear me call them almonds from time to time. <laughs> but my middle son and I farm together as well, doing custom work. And so we're right in Modesto, which is halfway between San Francisco and Yosemite Valley. Right. And you were, uh, congratulations a couple years ago being a Century Farm uh, for your family. It's a big, big day, and congratulations. Yep. It's a great thing to be a Century Farm. Uh, I'm also uh, currently serving as president of California Farm Bureau, and I think that's why you probably asked me to be here. So well, you know, here. and as we find out, we talk about stewardship, and you talk about oil, or oil, air, and 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 water, uh, any environmental issue. A, a lot of that comes from, or at least, uh, California has a lot to say about what comes across the country. So we welcome you here to RFD tonight, uh, Lonnie. Let's start with you, and 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 maybe just back up a little bit. Why why do a program? Of course, you have great products, and and we maybe we talk about those as we move through the hour. But why talk about about stewardship. I appreciate that. Well, agricultural liquid fertilizers is about a lot more than just selling products. We're dedicated to responsible nutrient management, and with that comes education. So the issues that are important to the farmers across the country are important to us, mm -hmm. and we think that we want to give them an opportunity to hear from a couple industry thought leaders. Uh, some good topics. Very good. And in fact, our viewers as well. And the viewers, uh, we know that you have comments when it comes to these kinds of topics. And we're going to open up our telephone lines 
right now, and we look forward to hearing from you with things like, as we talk about tonight, we're going to start out talking about water, water quality, water control, uh, allocations in California, for example. Our toll-free number for you to join us on this or any topic you hear and you'd like to chime in on the conversation, please do. This is your program, RFD TV Live. It's because live you can join us as the program continues on. 877-731-6733. Lines open now, and we look forward to hearing from you. Again, uh, what are some of the things that you're doing that maybe uh, we could share with others? Being good stewards, we want to hear from you. Let's start, Paul. When you talk about land and, and water uh, conservation, as I mentioned, starting in California seems like the right thing to do and kind of come across the country. You're so well aware of that statewide. Let's talk about that as it relates to uh, water and uh, stewardship. Well, <clears throat> I think especially in California when you talk about the fact that we have over 350 different commodities we raise in the state, we have such a diversity of microclimates. And what makes California be able to produce is the fact that we do have water. When you think about we have areas like the Inland Empire down in Riverside and San Bernardino area where they have their average rainfall is two inches of rainfall a year. Mm. Or we have the Sonoma Coast where you get the great wine grapes and a lot of the other commodities out of there where they have 60 inches of rainfall a year. You would think with California position, position between the Sierra Nevadas and the Pacific Ocean we should not be for want of water and yet we actually are. This year we're seeing a lot of our farmers in the Central Valley in the south part of the state cut back on their water allotments. They thought early on they were going to have 25 percent of their water and it's now been reduced down to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. And so when you have permanent crops, pomegranates, pistachios, and other things that cost thousands and thousands of dollars an acre to establish, and now someone has said, you're not going to have the water to grow your crop. You know, in California, we've been able to double our agricultural output over the last 40 years with the same amount of applied water. That's phenomenal. When mm -hmm. you talk about sustainability and the wise use of a resource, uh, we've been able to double that agricultural pro uh, production. The problem is, as we do that and we we use water conservation, we also start concentrating some of the problems that we have, things like selenium in the water, maybe nitrates in the water, and that's something we probably ought to talk about later on tonight. Yeah. Who, where does that control come from? Is it, it's legislated uh, th uh, yeah, from, good, from I, Sacramento? Yeah, everybody hears about the San Joaquin Delta region, which is just to the east of the San Francisco Bay, and so we have the San Joaquin River and the Sacramento being the two big rivers and other tributaries that flow out under the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, a number of years ago, they put in the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project so that they could take excess amounts of water in the Delta and ship it down into the arid Central Valley. But when you think about three of the largest agricultural counties in the entire United States are in that area, and they're dependent upon having that exported water, what we call exported water, and really it's taking water from areas that has plentiful water in most years and then transporting that down into the Central Valley to grow crops that people enjoy on their plates every day. And you and I, before going on the air, I asked if you know, obviously in your area and in many areas of California, it's year-round production, maybe different crops, but that need for water never goes away, like it does maybe in South Dakota, uh, does yeah. in South Dakota, Iowa, and other places. Yeah. Yeah, you can cut back a little bit in the wintertime, but we have winter vegetables and a lot of those things, lettuce and those leafy greens that people enjoy. Uh, during the winter months, 65% of the fresh uh, uh, vegetables and the leafy greens that find their way to the eastern part of the United States come out of California. What's the situation as we sit here now uh, at this time of the year as far as your outlook, as far as what the water supply and, and the situation is going to be this, this early growing season? We're in a very dry year. Um, you know, 70% of our water storage is in our snowpack, and we have less than a normal snowpack this year, and so it's going to be a dire year. But the other problem it does then is makes farmers look to trying to tap some of their underground aquifers. And that's where we're starting to see all of a sudden a concentration of buildup of selenium and some other things that have been there and it's taken years and years and years for them to find their way into the groundwater. And so we know that in agriculture, we, uh, and we have been over the last 20, 30 years, growing differently and utilizing technology and some of the things that your products, Lonnie, that you come up with to help us be able to be better stewards with the inputs that we put, not only the crop protection materials, but the nutrients that we use to grow the crops. Very good. So Mark, yeah, one thing please. I was just going to add in there is if a crop has the right amount of nutrients, it's a lot more water efficient. 
because if the crop is short on any one nutrient, let's say it's short on potassium, what the plant is going to try to do is it's going to pull in more water because that's typically how the, the nutrient's going to flow in. So early in the season, if you're short on that nutrient, your crop becomes a water waster. Wow, great point. And that's agri, you know, you, that's what part of your research is all about, that it kind of comes full circle here, but that's really, the, as Paul mentions, the products that you deliver help the plant be more, most the efficient that it can be. Balanced nutrition helps the plant to efficiently utilize water, and that's what we're all about. Well, and we know how important, uh, Paul uh, brought a video with him, the, how important water is to all of us, no matter what state we're in. By the way, we want to hear from you. Our telephone lines are open right now. If you're just joining us and you have a comment or a question about water in your area or quality, something you're doing on your farm or ranch, there is the toll-free number. The importance of water as it relates in this video to all the growers, and particularly this one in California. Nice and all well we found, um, hit it with a grader one day cleaning the road up here and um, asked some of the neighbors about it and they said it probably been here since the 40s or 50s and um, when things got tight or run out of water we thought we'd um, come spend some money and try to get it cleaned up and see if we couldn't make something of it and we probably spent 60, 70 grand in um, equipment and cleaning and, and got it all set up and gave it a try the other day and I pumped, pumped water for maybe a about a minute and um, sucked it dry, so we're going to have to walk away from this one and, and give it a try on another site that we have. Oh, it's bad. They, um, right now, um, you know, we don't know what we're going to get allocated for water. They're talking it could be, you know, 10, 15 percent, and uh, we can't bank on that. We can't bank on maybes. We need to get contracts and start gearing up for next year and I just don't know what I'm going to do at this point. If I'd have stayed in school longer and um, instead of going to work with dad right away, you know, maybe um, I could fall back on something but, you know, I have no education outside of high school. Just been farming my whole life. We've been in close ties with the farming community, and like I said, uh, they get their water allocation, then they, we know that our, the economy is going to get better. Because uh, the limited uh, amount of uh, money that's flowing to this area, uh, children are suffering. Uh, lack of food, for one thing, lack of clothing. Uh, I, we're coming into the winter time. I hate to see what it's going to look like, but uh, I don't think it's going to be very pleasant. We farm. 15, 1600 acres out here, and, and it's, it's nice to know this is my office, what I come to every day. Wow, and you had a comment while we were watching that together. I wanted to share right away here. Yeah, so I, I, the farmer on there said, I have no education outside of high school. That was his quote. And First of all, I guess I just wanted to say farmers are tremendously well-educated. Many have been to college or even beyond that, master's degrees and things. So they're tremendously well-educated from that side. But there's also the practical knowledge side and just all the additional training that they get uh, as they go throughout their career. So, for example, I went to South Dakota State for four years. That was a long time ago now, but uh, I mean, very little of what I learned back then I'm using today. Things have changed so dramatically in farming in the last 20 some years since I was in college that a farmer has to continue to get educated every year as things change. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that's a good point. Uh, what about the water? So, you know, you, were, you have a whole different situa situation in the Dakotas, but from what you saw there, I'm going to get back to you just in a minute about South sure. Dakota, but your thoughts in watching that video. 
Uh, well, it, it's just a little bit different, obviously, from where we're from when we have winter from November all the way till July. No, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. seems about that now. way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, we're so much cooler that we don't have to have as much moisture. So we only get about 20 or 22 inches of total annual precipitation. That includes the snow. And we don't have irrigation or anything, and we can still raise a tremendous crop. So, I mean, I, I guess in looking at that, I feel really fortunate that we have the conditions that we have, even though sometimes we like to complain about wherever we're from. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one last question before we go to Brian here, Paul, and that is uh, you, uh, you mentioned allocation and our, your, your uh, member mentioned allocation. Tell us a little bit how, how, how long, how does that work? How much lead time do they have? Do they know what they're going to be able to use? Well, you hope that at the beginning of the year for planning uh, purposes, and a lot of the folks in the Central Valley, they have, you know, they'll do melons, watermelons, pumpkins, uh, beets, cotton, um, canning tomatoes. Uh, they'll end up in your ketchup bottle. There's so many of those products that they need to make those planning decisions early on. They need to go to the banker and get their lines of credit lined up. And so we have been after the... Uh, uh, Bureau of Reclamation to come out with their anticipation based on what they see for the early amounts of rain. This last December we had a really good rainfall year in the beginning of January and then the spigot from Mother Nature was shut off. Yeah. And so <clears throat> they started talking about 35, then 30, then 25, and now 20 percent allocation. So there were a lot of folks that actually had gone out and bought tomato plants that they're not going to have the water to grow those tomato plants. Wow. We had a caller that uh, wasn't able to hang on, but just, they just wanted to ask a question. I'll pose it to all of you. It says, when it gets dry, what, what does that do to our uh, water supply when you're using it for irrigation? Well, I mean, when you think about, especially in California, and as I go around and talking to folks, we should not be for want of water. We've got the Pacific Ocean on our west coast and the Sierra Nevadas, and we can utilize desalinization and other things. Um, for a lot of different things, but with water, especially stored water through reservoirs or dams, we create hydroelectric power, which is a very clean source of power, renewable power. We use it for recreation. Um, we use it for pulse flows for environmental purposes. We use it for manufacturing. We use it for people to drink, and we use it to grow food. Mm -hmm. Well, well, and you talk a lot about this very topic, Brian, on Ag PhD on RFD TV, over and over again, talking about tiling and, and, and erosion. Yeah, so to begin with, though, I guess I like to look at what has happened with corn yield and soybean yield in the last 50 years, and we've been able to approximately double corn yields in the last 50 years or more, approximately double soybean yields or more in the last 50 years, and all this is done with not using tremendous amounts of fertilizer anymore. And if you look, I've got some slides here on how much farmers are applying for corn and wheat and soybeans versus what they're removing. And what I wanted to show, if you look uh, with, uh, with some of these charts here that, I'm, that we're gonna pull up in just a second, where as farmers, we're barely applying as much fertilizer as what is getting removed from the soil. And in some cases, so like in, in corn there, when you look at phosphorus, you see the in the in the center of the screen, it, they're all negative numbers. In other words, we're pulling more out of the soil than what we're applying. So a lot of people have the misconception that we're applying vast amounts of fertilizer and all this fertilizer is polluting the world. Well, in a lot of cases, we're barely putting enough on there. We don't want to waste money as farmers. Fertilizer is very expensive. We want to use just what it takes to produce a good crop. And then when we go to tiling, I, I guess what I wanted to show when we have poor drainage versus tile drainage, I just had a, a little graphic to, to show that for you. It, it, it amounts to this. In a lot of cases in our fields, we have high water tables in the spring. And when we have high water tables, roots cannot grow down into those water tables. So uh, farmers are putting tile in the ground, and when they do that, all they're doing is lowering the water table. They're not taking all the water out of the ground. So Paul was just mentioning how he needs so much water, and a lot of people say, well, you're just wasting water, you're getting rid of it. No, what we're doing, we're only removing some water out of the soil early in the season, just lowering the water table down to, let's say, three or four feet. Mm -hmm. And so it's very good for crop production. We can dramatically increase the amount of crop we're raising.
But the concern comes where people will say, well, that water that's coming out of the tile has to be polluted. There have to be nutrients in there and chemicals, and that's got to be bad for us. But what a lot of people don't realize is that soil is a tremendous filter for water. And by the time that soil has filtered the water, the water that comes out is going to be pretty clean. So I just uh, ha had gotten fr so frustrated with this that what I did is we took a couple of our guys and we went out to the river and we pulled water quality samples just this last fall. One mm. of the main rivers in the state of South Dakota, it's called the Big Sioux River. It flows from north to south along the eastern side of the state. And so the first thing I was going to show is nitrate nitrogen that we sampled. And if you take a look at nitrate nitrogen, you, you can actually have up to 10 parts per million and it's still drinking water quality. So in all cases, it was still drinking water quality. But if you see north of Brookings, about 50 miles north of where we farm, the nitrate nitrogen level is 1.5 parts per million. Just north of Sioux Falls, right where we farm, it was a little bit less. And then right south of Sioux Falls, the largest city in the Dakotas, look at how much the nitrate jumps up. And it's the same thing with phosphorus. When you take a look at phosphorus, it's the same kind of deal where the farmers are not the ones that are getting phosphorus and nitrate into the water. It's the big cities. It's the sewage treatment plants, the water treatment plants. And also, it's a lot of people putting too much fertilizer on their lawns and, and things like that. And so, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that farmers do everything perfect. But we're really trying to be great stewards of the land. We have financial incentive to do that. We don't want to over-apply fertilizer. And we also have the incentive that we live right there. I live on a farm, and for most of my life, I've drank well water. The last thing I want to do is pollute the water. Right. You have, uh, again, and again, uh, dissolved. Is that what you had? Another yeah. Oh, yeah. So I had dissolved solids. I had coliform. All these things. It all shows the, the, the same thing, that basically right north of the largest city in the Dakotas, the water was cleaner than right south of the largest city in the Dakotas. But again, I don't want to cause great alarm here. It's not that it was horrible. Uh, like I said, with the nitrate, it was still drinking water quality. The other thing, I had one other uh, slide that, that we could pull up that had a, a bunch of different levels of nutrients that are in tile water. And so this came right out of a tile line on our farm last summer. And when you take a look at this little chart that I've got here, here we you'll go. see that nitrate nitrogen was only 2.4 parts per million. 2.4, that's drinking water quality. If you look at all those things, this is coming right out of the tile line. And I, the only reason why I pulled this was because our guys on the farm said, boy, that water is really clean and nice. We've been filling up our water jugs out of it all summer. And I said, <laughs> well, let me just <laughs> sample this just to show you it is actually clean stuff. The other thing I wanted to point out there, you'll see under phosphorus, it says ND. What that stands for is non-detectable. And phosphorus is the number one water quality issue that we've got in the United States today. If you end up with more phosphorus in the water, there's going to be more algae, and that's obviously a bad thing. But what people don't realize is phosphorus doesn't leach down in the ground. It's not going to end up in the tile water at all. What will happen is if you can reduce erosion, then you reduce the amount of phosphorus that goes into the lakes and rivers and streams. And when you install tile in a field, it dramatically reduces erosion. So with phosphorus, like I say, it will not move in soil. So when farmers apply it near the surface of the soil, it's pretty much going to stay there. If they put it two inches deep, that's where it's going to be. So if they can prevent erosion, that's really going to help. Wow, good information. You can tell why we are glad to have Brian here and uh, Paul as well from California. Lonnie, you brought some great folks here tonight to talk about stewardship. If you're just joining us, uh, we're talking about things like air and water quality. We're going to talk about crop protection as we come back. We're going to take our first break. Let me give you our telephone number and you may have a question or a comment or uh, chime in on what you're doing as far as water quality and your farm or ranch. There is our toll-free number. Lines are open now for you to join us. It's RFDT. TV Live with our friends from Agriculture Liquid Fertilizer. We're going to come back and talk about crop protection as we continue our discussion. You're watching RFD TV Live You're right here on Rural America's Most Important Network. Equipment's ready. The seed's in the barn. You have a strategy to overcome the challenges you'll face, and your crop protection products are pretty well locked in. But maybe you still haven't finalized your fertilizer plans. If not, visit agroliquid.com today. With products formulated for superior nutrient uptake, 
unsurpassed application flexibility, and proven by years of extensive research, this may be the season to take your yields to the next level using agriculture liquid fertilizers. It was Dish Network that first launched RFD-TV over 12 years ago, and then Rural TV this past year. And it's Dish Network that continues to lead the way in providing better rural programming in the most ways to better serve its customers. Now, Dish Network introduces the new Heartland package, which combines both RFD-TV and Rural TV Family Net with several other family-oriented channels for the one low price of only $5 per month. Of course, RFD-TV is still available as part of the DISH Top 200 package and Rural TV Family Net also offered in the DISH 250 package if that better fits your family needs. If you want all the great programming from Rural Media Group's networks, then switch to DISH Network and the new Heartland package today by calling 1-855-204-9841. Oh, by the way, RFD HD is included from DISH Network in any of their packages for no additional charge. You can't fill a barrel any fuller than its lowest stave. And your crops can't do any better than the nutrient that's in shortest supply. Your yield potential is only as good as the weakest nutrient in your fertilizer program. Give your crops more than just NPK. Prescription apply all the micronutrients your crop needs. Each one customized for your crop's potential. Microlink. Linking yield to potential. Welcome back to RFD TV Live. I'm Mark Oppel. Thanks for joining us. We're here with our friends from Agriculture Liquid Fertilizer talking about their products, but as it relates to stewardship, and a lot of talk about stewardship, we spent some time in our first section talking about water, the importance that we know all across the country. Uh, Paul, uh, California Farm Bureau State President, giving us a great uh, example of how important it is. Uh, but, and before we leave that, you, Brian Hefty uh, talking about erosion and, and water water control and uh, you had a headline that kind of caught your eye you wanted to share with us. Yeah, so when we talk about water quality, if we can as farmers reduce the amount of erosion, we're going to have cleaner water. And I feel that we've done a very good job of reducing erosion over the years and making our water cleaner. Yet the headlines a lot of times read and there was one that came out from a major newspaper last summer and it said plowing away the prairie at a price. And part of the whole thing is that, oh, as farmers, we're tearing up all this new ground and that we're causing a lot of environmental damage by, uh, uh, by doing so. So the things that I wanted to point out and the things that were neglected in this article, they didn't put the facts in. The fact is we're farming fewer crop acres than we were just 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. NRCS data shows erosion is down approximately 35% versus 30 years ago. And... It, to finish up on that too with uh, the erosion thing, if you think about like the dirty 30s, uh, that was the last time we had as bad a drought as we did last summer. Uh, you know, you didn't hear about all this erosion problem or dust blowing all over last summer. We've done a much better job of uh, of preventing erosion. And as farmers, we're producing more food than ever on less fertilizer per bushel than ever before, and we've got the safest and most abundant food and water supplies in the world here in the United States. So I think as farmers, we're doing quite a few things right. You know, you mentioned it's funny, uh, it caught my eye that the 97.3 million acres the USDA said we're gonna plant to corn, the last time we were anywhere, uh, that was, that's a, a new, since 1936. Yep. Did you know that? Yes, I read that as well. 102 million acres in 1936. I guess my question to viewers was, how did they do that back then, you know, <laughs> 102 million acres. But you make a great point, uh, plowing away the prairie as it relates to erosion uh, and control. I think we have a caller. I'm not sure they want to talk about water, but they uh, took us up on our offer to give us a call. And so we go to James from Missouri. James, welcome to our program. Good to hear from you. Yes, good evening. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I had a question, uh, maybe for Darren, I'm not sure who, but uh, we use a lot of uh, chicken litter for phosphorus needs. And I was wondering, do you have more trouble with the litter leaching out of the soil with litter versus commercial fertilizer? 
Okay, uh, thanks for the question. And, and first of all, I'm quite commonly mistaken for my brother Darren, but I am Brian Hefty. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as the, the, the chicken litter, uh, let me just talk about manure in general. Manure is a fantastic fertilizer, and a lot of people get concerned that manure is harmful. Manure has great fertility value, and it, it's one of the best things you can do uh, on your land uh, applying that fertilizer. But you have to know how many nutrients are in there. So the first thing that I always recommend to anybody, whether it's chicken litter or any other type of manure, is find out what there is for nutrients in there, find out what your soil can hold and what your soil really needs, and then apply it accordingly. In terms of leaching, phosphorus really isn't going to leach at all. What we get concerned about with phosphorus is that we don't get it down deep enough in the soil. I, I would like to somehow see that phosphorus, that, that chicken litter, get down a little bit deeper. If the phosphorus remains on top of the soil, then we're subject to losing it from erosion, and then it can end up in the water, just like what I was talking about earlier. So I, I, I think it's great that you're, you're using the chicken litter. Don't worry about leaching too much. Just worry about protecting it from erosion. Very good. And again, we appreciate your calls. Let's give you a telephone number. I wanted to do that. I forgot to do that. But uh, here it is, toll-free, 877-731-6733. Lines, I'm not sure lines are open. We have a lot of callers that have some thoughts they want to share. We're going to go to California here, Paul. Uh, Roxanne joining us from uh, California. Welcome to our program, Roxanne. Thank you. I had a question about desalinization. You mentioned it, and I was wondering if you'd elaborate a little more. I'm not a farmer. I'm a consumer, but uh, as a resident Californian, I don't think the water situation is going to get better, better by itself. So I wondered what needs to be done with desalinization. Uh, who needs to make the investment? What's holding things up, and what can the public do to really get the process going? Well, unfortunately, uh, uh, Roxanne, today in California, the California, most any siting of a desal plant is going to be on the coast. And the Coastal Commission has a real control, a stranglehold control on what can happen on the coast. And, and so they just don't really want to have that kind of a facility. And unfortunately, a number of years ago, they built a desal plant in Santa Barbara. And then they decommissioned it. It never even... Uh, created an ounce of water because they just shut it down. So investors will build the plants. And with climate change and the things that climatologists say could be upon us in the future, um, we need to be able to utilize our resource that we have off the, off the coast in the Pacific Ocean. And that is to utilize that water. It comes at a cost. It's coming down. It used to be $3,000 an acre foot. And today, I think it's uh, closer to $1,000 an acre foot. Uh, for that water and so especially for our, our very uh, arid areas uh, San Diego um, Los Angeles a lot of those areas uh, you've got the population centers there if we could get the political um, wherewithal to get it done uh, I think uh, desalinization is a part of the future for California but what else are you going to do because I mean, at some point, you've got to have more water as the population continues to grow and as we're going to try to produce more food. Well, and as I said earlier, we have produced, uh, with the same amount of applied water in agriculture, we've doubled our agricultural output. And when you think about what our cropping patterns have changed, and today as we talk about the Mediterranean diet and so much of what folks want to have with a diverse diet, and that's coming out of California, but you need to have... Uh, those supplies of water. If you think about strawberries, and everybody likes to have fresh strawberries, a strawberry grower has $20,000 an acre invested before they pick a berry. Wow. That's a lot of investment for somebody to have, not to sure if they're going to have the water, or if they're not going to be able to grow the crop adequately and have the labor to pick it. You know, and it works kind of into our next, we mentioned before the break, we wanted to talk about crop protection, and Roxanne's a great example, uh, Brian. She, uh, not a farmer, a consumer, but very concerned, and I'm glad for the call, uh, Roxanne. I really appreciate the call coming in. Uh, there are a lot of concerns, a lot of non-farmers, non-agriculturalists, about the uh, 
safeness of our pesticides, I guess. Right. That's what, and when, and when you talk about crop protection. Right. And as farmers, we really don't want to use pesticides. We don't want to use fertilizer. We don't want to invest in anything. But unfortunately, we have to feed our crop. We have to control the weeds. We have to control the pests that are going to attack that crop. And with pesticides, there have been a lot safer products developed now. And so I just was going to show a little bit about LD50, because this is one of the things you can look at on a food label, on a pesticide label. Okay. And to begin with, the LD50, what that is, it stands for lethal dose 50%. It's how much does it take to uh, kill 50% of a, a test population. And obviously they're testing it on rats and, and things like that, not mm -hmm. human beings, but still they extrapolate the data. And it's like my dad said, uh, uh, the dose makes the poison. So the LD50 for table salt, for example, because table salt will kill you, is 3,000 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. The LD50 for atrazine is also 3,000 milligrams per kilogram. The LD50 for caffeine is 200 milligrams per kilogram. So what that's saying, since atrazine is not a carcinogen, is that it actually takes 15 times more atrazine to kill you than it does caffeine. But wow. I'll bet you that if I put a little bit of caffeine in your drink and a little bit of atrazine in your drink, I know the one you'd be concerned about, right? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and so it just comes back to misperceptions about what these things are. And what I get frustrated with is there are a lot of these old products that actually were dangerous that have been banned in our country, and they're still legal for sale in some foreign countries. And you were talking about strawberries and, you know, some of these fresh uh, foods that we get in the middle of the winter time. Where do they come from? Some of these same countries that are still allowing the use of some of the dangerous products we banned here years ago. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Let, let yeah. me just follow up because I think Brian makes a very good point. And maybe to put it... And, and a little bit more for, for somebody that's not necessarily a farmer. Um, you know, I've been licensed with the state of California. You have to go through tests and everything with the state of California to be what they call a pest control operator. I apply pesticides. Pesticides are pharmaceuticals for plants. And so another way I look at it is if you take too many aspirin, it's not going to be very healthy for you. And so we follow a very regimented prescription that is given by pest control advisors that are, again, licensed by the state. They have to have a college degree. They go out and they do testing. When I first started in 1986 doing pesticide applications, there were. There was products out there mm -hmm. that we worried about, secondary pest infestations. And that was because we killed off the beneficial insects. And then you would have a secondary pest infestation. Today, because of technology and because of science, we are so focused on the pest and not hurting anything else in the environment that we're worried about resistance management. When you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, here, take this prescription and take all of it. Because if you don't, you might get that cold back, that flu back, whatever it is. So you have to take all of it. And so today, we are more worried about resistance management. On our own farm, a lot of what we use is organic certified, OMRI certified. The chemicals that we are utilizing today, the pharmaceuticals that we're using today for agricultural uh, production are so different than they were and it was because of technology. And I think Lonnie's company, when we talk about nutrient management, it has been the stepchild because everybody was out there worried about pesticides whether they were herbicides to kill weeds or um, to kill bad unwanted insects because nobody wants a worm in their apple. And, but we didn't think about the nutritional side of things. And that's where I think agriculture has really come around. I know on our farm, we have reduced our fertilizer use because of a product they make called Enhance. And I didn't even know they made it until I met Lonnie one day and I was talking to him about this product. And he goes, oh, that's a product of our company. But we're able to utilize less nitrogen fertilizer and get... Uh, more efficiency, more uptake. And so technology will get there, but it comes at a cost. It comes at an investment cost. And so we have to make sure that regulatory agencies and government, that they will do the oversight, but allow these companies to come in and develop the new technologies that will allow us to be even more sustainable in the future. One of the, oh, one Go of ahead, the things, just to, just to comment on that real quick, with the government, the EPA, they actually try to streamline new pesticides that are much safer to replace the older dangerous products. So that was something I didn't even realize till just a few years ago, but they'll put it on what's called the fast track, so it will come to market a little sooner mm -hmm. if they believe it has a much better environmental profile. 
I want to give our telephone number if you would like to join our conversation and uh, again chime in with some thoughts that you have regarding crop protection. Maybe it's water. We're going to talk about the biotech coming up here as well. So we're not, we've got a long way to go to yet tonight, but there is our toll free number 877 731 6733. I understand lines are open now. If you call, you'll get through and talk to Jennifer. She'd like to talk to you too. All right. Let's say you had a thing on safety before we leave that. I think an yes. interesting uh, couple of points regarding uh, common pesticides and safety. <laughs> yes. So Roundup, for example, it's a pesticide that's widely sold, widely used. And did you know that the active ingredient works on an enzyme that's found only in plants? There's no possible physical way that the active ingredient could ever hurt a human being because it works on that enzyme found only in plants. We don't have that enzyme. Callisto, for example, one of the most popular corn herbicides, comes from a tree. Treflan was originally a clothing dye. Silencer is the reproduction of the poison found in the chrysanthemum flower. It's like sprinkling flowers over your crop. Hmm. And Tordon, when that first came out ah. about 30 years ago, we had a manufacturer's rep at a meeting introducing that product to a whole bunch of farmers. And he said, yeah, let me show you how safe this product is. And he poured himself a glass and drank it. And I, always, I tell people this story, and I'm not telling you to go out and drink your pesticides or anything like that. But just the point is that a lot of these products are actually quite safe to human beings now, human beings now compared to what we had 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there were a lot of dangerous things out there. A lot of those are gone now. So I feel real good as a farmer, and I often tell people too, if you look at the LD50s, you look at the labels of a lot of these products, I'll bet you that there isn't anything, I know there isn't anything on our farm that we're spraying on our crop that's even half as dangerous as some of the, some of the household cleaners my wife has below our kitchen sink. You spend a lot of time on this in your in your seminars yeah. that you and Darren do during the during the winter months. Talk about the, the educational things. I think is that uh, safe to say? Yeah. So it, it just comes down to understanding what some of these things are. And again, I'm not sitting here saying all pesticides are perfectly safe or right. anything else. But I just think we have to understand what the risks are. For example, uh, Paul mentioned about bugs feeding on an apple. Okay. Well, if there is a bug feeding on an apple, did you know that the plant will produce more natural carcinogens than if that plant was never fed by fed on by a pest so what I'm saying is if you can kill the bugs you're going to have a product that should be it should have fewer natural carcinogens in it Lonnie Smith uh, agriculture liquid fertilizer uh, it all comes back we as we kind of wind up crop protection a lot of the things that you do on a day-by-day -day basis in your research and development, taking all this into account for your customers. You've seen so many tremendous advancements in crop protection, and farmers are kind of relegated to utilizing the same fertilizer materials that they've used for years, decades even. For decades, agricultural liquid fertilizers has been producing products that are different technologies. So higher efficiencies, giving the farmers more options to go out and specifically apply the nutrients, the nutrient balance that the crops need to produce a healthier crop that's more disease and pest resistant. Yeah, there that, are advancements. That, that point that you just made there though, that's really important because if you have a very healthy crop, it is more pest resistant. So uh, diseases, bugs, anything else, there's less chance that I would need to go spray a pesticide if I've got a very healthy plant and it all starts with crop nutrition. Balance crop nutrition. You can't do it just with the N, P, and K that you've been applying for yeah, centuries. Very good. All right. And with that, we're going to take our last break tonight, uh, our viewers, and uh, we'd like to hear from you if the telephone uh, number there on the screen. If you have a question or a comment during our break, especially, give us a call. We'd like to hear from you. Biotech is going to be our next and last topic of conversation as we head to the top of the hour. We want to hear from you, 877-731-6733. Conversation continues. Our friends from Agriculture Liquid Fertilizer right here on RFD TV Live on Rural America's most important network. Your equipment's ready. The seed's in the barn. You have a strategy to overcome the challenges you'll face and your crop protection products are pretty well locked in. But maybe you still haven't finalized your fertilizer plans. If not, visit agroliquid.com today. With products formulated for superior nutrient uptake, unsurpassed application flexibility, and proven by years of extensive research, this may be the season to take your yields to the next level using agriculture liquid fertilizers. 
A subscription to RFD TV, the magazine is still an exceptional value. You'll receive six exciting issues throughout the year. The March April issue showcases the highly anticipated Live from Daryl's House. Join Daryl Hall on Sunday nights from his country home, featuring a mix of well known performers and the stories behind the music. You'll also see exciting photos from the 2013 Rose Parade from Pasadena, California. And RFD TV is proud to present The International, the premier world class indoor show jumping competition, which will be returning to Omaha. There's also information about the Southern Plains Farm Show, along with recipes, news, and exciting programming for both networks with descriptive listings of all shows. A one-year subscription is just $30 and renewals only $25. There are three convenient ways to order. Order your RFD TV, the magazine subscription today. You expect a lot from this seed. And as it grows through each stage of development, Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers is there, feeding your crop exactly what it needs when it needs it. So no matter how you fertilize, no matter when, AgroLiquid efficiently brings all the nutrients your crop needs for a great harvest. From one kernel in the ground to 600 on the ear. For better yields and better quality, Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers. Welcome back to RFD TV Live. A fast hour. Our friends from Agriculture Liquid Fertilizer and the state of California. We have the state president of the Farm Bureau and uh, Brian Hefty, or is it Darren Hefty? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Hefty from Ag PhD that you see on Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern here on RFD TV. By the way, if you weren't with us at the beginning of our program, Brian and Darren and Ag PhD celebrating their 15th anniversary on RFD TV today. So happy anniversary, and we should have had Thanks. a cake or something. I guess we did have pie for <laughs> dessert tonight, but uh, let's talk about, well, let me give the telephone number. I guess, did I give the phone number? I'm I'm forgetting where I am here, but we are toll free 877-731-6733 for you to join us talking about uh, things mm -hmm. like uh, air and water quality, uh, crop protection. We're talking about biotech right now, and, and Brian, I'm going to start with you. You said before going on the air, you think, Mark, I think uh, biotech in general is misunderstood. I really do. And let me just give you a real quick example. So let's take the very first corn borer trait. Uh, European corn borer trade. It came out, I think it was 1996, something like that. And all that is, is a natural protein that humans can digest just fine, livestock can digest it just fine. There's just a certain insect that can't digest that. It basically sits in its stomach and rots it out and then that's how the bug dies. Well, there's another product that is actually used in organic production called Dipel that is very, very similar to this BT that's in the corn. It is also a natural protein that humans and livestock can digest just fine, and certain insects can't digest it, sits in their stomach, rots it out, and the bug dies. Huh. But people have a big problem with it all of a sudden when it's put into the crop as opposed to when the product that's very similar sprayed over the top of the crop, and I don't understand why. <laughs> well, I'm, you're, we're here to you made, give us a little bit more explanation here, on, again, on, on your thoughts on current testing, labeling, those kinds well, of things. Well, okay, so for example, like when Roundup Pretty Soybeans first came out about 15 years ago, they underwent more testing and evaluation than any other product in the history of the world before getting labeling through EPA and FDA. And these biotech products are tested and tested and tested. The companies are spending billions of dollars in testing to find out if they're safe or not. And we want products that are safe. And I'll just give the quick example of in Europe, most biotech things are frowned upon. In fact, you can't even find biotech things over in Europe. Well, since we've been using biotech crops for almost 20 years now, if we've been using them for 20 years, Europe has not been using them for 20 years. After 20 years, shouldn't we see some dramatic differences if these biotech products were so dangerous? I mean, shouldn't their livestock be a lot better or their people should be living 20 years longer or whatever? But there isn't any difference. The mm. biotech crops are safe. And I'm not going to sit here and say that all biotech products that will ever come out are going to be safe. But I'm just saying that before biotech crops get labeled, they have to go undergo such tremendous testing. And science always proves what's right or wrong and so far it's proven it's it, it, it's been proven to be safe 
Over you, Paul, in the California Farm Bureau, I'm sure, spends a lot of time talking about biotech, the industry. We're going to come back to you, by the way, too, Brian. But uh, maybe share some thoughts from your California perspective. Well, we just had a, a ballot initiative in the November ballot, Prop 37, and it was called the Right to Know Initiative. And, and I think in agriculture, we don't have a problem with folks wanting to know what's in their food or how it was produced. And we can do that today with the technology we have, with the smartphone technology. You should be able to go up and take a picture of a barcode of a product and see what was in that product. I guess at some point in time, will it make a decision or will it make any decision in your buying choices? Uh, certainly, if you buy organic today, there's no biotech products in organic. And so we see a lot of our organic producers that are doing okay, but it's kind of met a certain level. It's growing, but it's growing uh, maybe not as fast as what some would like to see it grow. But still, you have to get over that whole idea of the consumer's right to know. And we can sit here and say it's safe all day long, but the consumer wants to have the ability to know what's in their product. And so we just have to find out a way not to have it on a label that somebody can sue you over. And the problem with the initiative they had in California that was a trial lawyer's um, heyday because if you didn't have the right wording on a label and maybe a product was going to be shipped out of state but somehow it got put on a store shelf somebody could go in and, and sue that store owner they could come back and sue the manufacturer of that food product and that's just not right so if a consumer wants the right to know let's figure out a way to give them the information they want to know we have consumer reports on the car you drive let's figure out a way to do it we know there's probably 26 states they're going to be dealing with this question, and I know it's a challenge for the food manufacturers of the country, uh, but we also know that in California and in the entire United States, the American farmer uh, is probably the most technologically advanced. When we talk about sustainability, we have seven billion people in the world today, and we know that the water and the land resources are not growing to be able to feed those people in the way they need to be fed. And the United States will drive the ability and drive the train to be able to feed a growing world population. But it's going to take technology. It's going to take the technology from the crop protection folks. It's going to take from your agriculture. It's going to take the technology so that we can do more with less. Real quick, the telephone number. We have about five minutes before we have to start wrapping up tonight and leave each of our panelists a chance for some closing thoughts. We do want to hear your thoughts, though, before that. At the number you see, toll-free 877-731-6733. We have a caller from Mississippi. Harlan, welcome to our program tonight. Yes, sir. Uh, what's that liquid fertilized made from? What's that liquid fertilized made from? All right, go ahead. Get a little history here on the products. Our products are manufactured from pharmaceutical grade raw materials. Uh, some are common in the fertilizer industry. Some are not as common. And it, uh, it's more a matter of how they're manufactured and the balance that they're manufactured with. Uh, the specific raw materials that go into it are, are kind of proprietary, and I'm not really uh, at liberty or I really don't know a lot of them. But I can tell you yeah. that by placing the products properly, by having products that don't negatively influence the plant physiology or the plant tissue, that have a balance of the nutrients that the plant requires to grow healthy, you can produce more crop on less applied fertilizer. How can we help uh, uh, Lonnie and others? Uh, where can they find their dealer near them or more information about the products? Yeah, if you'd visit agroliquid.com, and click on the Contact Us button. It'll bring up a map with a whole list of uh, dealers and distributors in your area. Get a hold of one of them, and they'd be happy to go through your soil test, your cropping goals, and uh, work out a program that's right for you. Very good. Back to biotech with our time remaining. And by the way, uh, callers, uh, viewers, if you have a question of any kind, we're talking about water, we talked about crop protection, talking about biotech uh, right now, uh, anything in those topics, we want to hear from you in the few minutes we have remaining. Other misconceptions, uh, Brian, that well, maybe you just share, um, we talk about biotech. Yeah, they yeah, think, so they, you think that people think it's just, it's altered, it's, it's synthetic or something that's not natural. Right, that's the whole thing, is they think it's, it's not natural. But it's hybrid corn natural. Uh, it, it, we didn't have hybrid corn in the United States either until man crossed 
corn plants together and made hybrid corn. There are all kinds of things in society that really wasn't originally natural. I mean, human beings had to get involved. And I have a lot of uh, misconceptions, a lot of examples I can give you, but there's one that really has stood out to me in the last year, and that's Agent Orange Corn. Agent Orange Corn. So Dow is going to be releasing this corn that is tolerant to 2,4-D through a biotech trait. And the only reason why any person in the United States probably knows of Agent Orange is from what happened in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Well, can Agent Orange actually be sprayed on unless corn? No, it can't. It's been banned in this country for years and years and years. So why are we talking about Agent Orange corn? And just so you understand what Agent Orange was, it was 50-50, 2,4-D, and 2,4-5-T. And you can see the LD50s, 1,500 milligrams per kilogram, they weren't tremendously dangerous. The problem was the 2,4-5-T was contaminated with dioxin back in the Vietnam days so the, the the company didn't even know it was in there and that's the reason why agent orange was harmful but the point is agent orange has been banned for years this corn has nothing to do with agent orange it's just going to get 2,4-D on it and because 2,4-D was one of the components in agent orange there wasn't anything wrong with the 2,4-D it was fine not that dangerous to human beings but a lot of media outlets have run with this agent orange corn thing because it's hype and it's it, 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 it's just unfortunate, I think, as farmers that we have to live with that when really the product is going to be pretty safe, the biotech is going to be safe, the product that's going to get sprayed on it is pretty safe. So why are we talking about that? I don't understand. Yeah. Well, that's a great example. A little real quick before closing thoughts, uh, Paul, you had some thoughts as, as it relates to sustainability. You wanted to talk about immigration real quick as it relates to it's a big issue in California again. Yeah, immigration is a big, uh, a big issue, and I know it's going to be on the forefront, and so hopefully we can get something. But let me, let me just finish. I know we're about ready to wrap yeah. up. You know, at the 1st of February, we all got to see the Super Bowl. And we heard there during one of the commercials about on the eighth day that God made a farmer and Paul Harvey's in 1978 mm -hmm. that he presented to the National FFA Convention. You know, it was a very nostalgic look at what the American farmer is. And while the sense of community and character is unchanged in farmers today, if you think back to 1978, the farmer fed himself and 50 other people. Today, the farmer feeds himself and over 155 other people. The only way we can do that is utilizing all the technology that we have at our hand. And it's from technology that comes from industry. It's the technology of utilizing GPS. It's the technology you have in your cell phone, your smartphone. But it's companies that come and help us develop safer crop protection materials so we can do more with less. Agriculture that will help us to utilize our nutritional programs to do more with less. The American farmer today is feeding the world. We have the safest, most reliable food sources. But the consumer should not be worried about what they are putting on their plate every day because folks are living longer because the food they're eating is more nutritious, safer, and we do it for less than 7% of their disposable dollar that allows them to send their kids to college, go on vacation, and buy a new car. Great. Well, thank you very much. We're going to come down the line. Appreciate you being here, Paul. Thank you. Anytime. We have about a minute and a half here. Brian, your final thoughts. Well, the number one thing I always talk to farmers about when it comes to all this is arm yourself with the facts and then get out there and tell your story. Because if you're not out there telling your story, somebody else is going to tell that story for you. And I don't think they've been doing a very good job. I think they're, they're, the general media is trying to mislead the the. American public into thinking that farmers are not doing a good job. But just like what Paul said, the U.S. has the safest and most abundant food and water supplies in the world. And by the way, the food supply is the cheapest of any country in the world. So we're doing all this. It's safe. It's inexpensive. It, it's a good thing. Great to have you here. Happy anniversary to you and uh, to Ag PhD. Thanks. Lonnie Smith, great program. You've got about 30 seconds. You have the last word. Sustainably producing more food on less applied fertilizer. We have a growing world population. It's not going to be met utilizing the same technologies and standards and materials that we've used to date. We need to do something more advanced. Agriculture liquid fertilizers provides the grower solutions to the challenges they face, whether they're water management, pest control issues, whether they're biotechnology. We don't know how much it's going to take to nutrient or feed the crops that are coming up, but we're working on it, and Agricultural Liquid Fertilizers is leading the industry in doing that. And with that, we say good night from Rural America's most important network.